Hello everyone, and welcome to Please Expand. I'm your host, Ahilius Rockney, and today I'll be interviewing David Wharton, author of The Invention of Science, A New History of the Scientific Revolution. This was a really fascinating interview where we spoke a lot about what science is, what science is not, how science develops, and some specific questions that David tries to answer in his book. We talk about why we should think of science as an objective enterprise that progresses over time. We talk about the necessary conditions for the rise of science in the 16th century. And we talk about the significance of his argument with respect to contemporary history of science and Thomas Kuhn's legacy. After the interview, I unpack a couple of the points that we discuss, as it is a bit of a technical interview. Uh, so if you don't manage to catch everything, make sure to stick around for that. But for now, without further ado, I give you David Wharton and the Invention of Science. Hello and welcome to Please Expand. I'm Ahilius Rockney and today I have David Wilson with me on the podcast. He has written widely on European culture, cultural and intellectual history, writing a biography on Galileo, and most recently in 2018, a book entitled Power, Pleasure and Profit. But today he is here to discuss the invention of science, a book that seeks to give a radically new perspective on the nature of science. David, thank you very much for being on, on the podcast. It's an honor to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. So when people normally think about science, they tend to equate it with just observation of the natural world. And they, I suppose they tend to think that it's something that came into being at some vague point in the ancient world, perhaps with Aristotle. Your account, on the contrary, claims that science began in 1572 and that science is not just observation of the natural world, but a very specific concept that is, is built on five interlocking features. Uh, very quickly, they are the, the printing press, which helped to foster an intellectual community, a family of new glass instruments, such as the telescope, which brought about new ways of observing the world, a new preoccupation with the test of experience and the rise of the experimental method, a new critical attitude to authority, and the new language that facilitated their new ways of thinking. That's an extremely diverse list of things that make up this concept that we call science. Could we begin by you saying a bit about them and how they relate to each other? Yes, well, I think the first thing to say is they don't relate to each other. That's to say they're, uh, they're, uh, it's a historical happenstance that a number of these things come together at the same time in the same place. And if they hadn't come together in the same time and in the same place, we wouldn't have anything that resembles modern science. So there's nothing inevitable about the, about the appearance of something that looks like modern science. You could have really quite a sophisticated technology as they had in, uh, in late medieval China, for example, a really quite sophisticated technology without having anything that resembles modern science. You can have an enormously sophisticated intellectual system as they had in classical Greece without having, as I would claim, anything that re represents modern science. So it, it, the it, conditions for the emergence of modern science aren't straightforward or obvious. They haven't, it only emerged in one place at one time, Europe in the 16th, 15th, 16th, 17th century, and uh, one has to ask, why has this happened here and now or there and then? And how has that made possible the transformation of the world that we live in and that every other human being will always live in, presumably from now on, short of nuclear catastrophe or something extraordinary like that? So I, so I think the first thing is to step right back from the notion that just being reasonable, just paying attention, just... Um, being an intelligent person will get you something that we can reasonably call science. It doesn't. The world has been full of reasonable, intelligent people, um, but it hasn't been full of scientists. Right. And one of the most uh, uh, striking claims that you make about the move from what we might call natural science, uh, philo natural philosophy, let's say, or yes. classical approaches to science and modern science is that people gave up this this very rational notion of certainty of, a, of an idea of what the world really is like with this probabilistic and temporal notion of truth or certainty, if we want to say. That, that's uh, right. I mean, Aristotle assumes that in the end, all knowledge ought to be deductive knowledge. 
you may have trouble formulating those terms, but in principle, those are the terms in which all knowledge ought to be possible to be formulated. And so insofar as you experience the world, it's only in order to put in place the right sort of deductive knowledge. And Aristotle has no real sense of testing experiential knowledge in order to see whether it's true or not. And the result is that out of an Aristotelian tradition, which accepts the authority of Aristotle, you're incapable of questioning systematically either what we would now call, think of as evidence, that's an important term that they don't have in that way, or that we would now think of as theories, again, an important term that they don't have in that way, because what they have is truth, and they have truth because it's deduced from unquestionable premises. Uh, and so as long as you've got a notion that philosophy is about syllogisms and syllogisms about necessary conclusions, and that there has been an authoritative set of necessary conclusions uh, with someone like Aristotle, you can't have the notion that knowledge has to be remade all the time. And you can't therefore, along with that, have a notion of knowledge as fundamentally progressive. And what suddenly occurs in the uh, early modern period is the emergence of the of those notions of remaking knowledge and of progress in knowledge, which are simply just not not there, even you know, even for the Aristotelians, sophisticated as they are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so your book is not just well, it is about the invention of science, but it's also about putting. It's also about arguing against competing accounts of science, and it's about putting things like truth and progress back into the concept of science. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, for the layman. Uh, it seems obvious that science deals with truth and that it gets better over time. But this is not the dominant position, right? Yeah. Uh, you say quite a bit about this. Yes. Uh, um, I mean, <laughs> the, the book consists of a series of polemics um, on a number of different fronts, I guess. And, and uh, it's very difficult. Uh, it was difficult writing the book. It's difficult expounding the book to keep the different fronts of the polemic separate. On the one hand, there's a polemic which we've just been talking about, which says that you had to kill off Aristotle in order to make possible a different sort of knowledge. And the key to killing off Aristotle, two things kill off Aristotle. Uh, one is the discovery of uh, new stars in the sky of Nova, this is 1572 and, um, uh, and Tycho Brahe. And the other is the discovery of, Amer of America. America is a fundamentally important observation unknown to the ancients. And it destroys the whole notion that the ancients knew all the important things. Crucially, the ancients had a theory of how the world was constructed, which makes America impossible. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, for me, I knew how to write the book once I realized that after the discovery of America, people had the idea of discovery. And before the discovery of America, people didn't have the word discovery in this in this crucial sense. So that's that's one polemic that the book's making, which is that all the people who say there's a classical medieval route that leads to modern science, which is a very powerful, strong intellectual tradition, are wrong. That would be enough uh, to, to take on. But the book is also directed against a line of thinking that really occurs only from the early 1980s on, which is what we might call post kuhnian cultural relativism in history of science. Uh, and it's a line of thinking that Kuhn himself turned against. Uh, although it's obviously a development of some of the views in Kuhn, uh, it's much more closely aligned to Foucault than it is to Kuhn. And, and, and that line of thinking wants to relativize the whole idea of science. Every culture has forms of knowledge that it regards as true. Our notion that our forms of knowledge are true is no different from the notions that other science cultures have. There's nothing unique or special about our claims to truth, all claims to truth are culturally relative and thus falsifiable. They'll seem wrong in other cultures. And consequently, uh, we have to write a history of science which doesn't acknowledge the possibility of progress because progress involves at least if not truth then an advance towards something, an advance of a sort. Kuhn wanted to maintain a notion of progress without having a notion of truth. And, uh, and I think one has to do that, but it's a difficult thing to do. So the cultural relativists of whom the leading example is Stephen Shapin, perhaps, um, wanted to argue that we should write a history of science in which far from thinking about discovery, what we would think about was power relationships, rhetorical techniques, persuasion. And we would see the scientific enterprise as fundamentally analogous to a political enterprise where you win support for a point of view and you do so through power 
influence, corruption, giving people jobs, giving people grants and so on, and not because you've got something that is culturally impartial, which we might call evidence or facts. So facts would become constructions rather than objective realities. And the claim is that other cultures would construct facts quite differently. And one of the things I wanted to argue in the book was that facts are a, the idea of a fact is a unique construction of our culture. And without that idea of a fact, you couldn't have built something resembling modern science. And that the idea of the fact uh, encapsulates the notion of an objective grasp on reality, which science is committed to making. Is it is it because uh, one of your aims in this book was to deal with uh, this uh, this interpretation of uh, the history of science that you focused on language so much? That's a that's a that's a very smart question. I don't think that's quite right um, because I think I was committed to getting at the language game because of where I came from. I didn't start as a historian of science. I started primarily as a historian of political theory. Uh, I thus was brought up within a world that included Quentin Skinner. And that was a world in which uh, one, uh, Skinner didn't start off thinking of himself, uh, well, Skinner started off thinking of himself as a Wittgensteinian. Um, and he changed his mind a bit about that later. But it was a world in which you understood political theory by understanding the language in which it was formulated and you understood changes in political theory as being changes in language. So it's natural with that background, when I come to do the history of science, I immediately carry over, you know, all this literature on what, what does Machiavelli mean by the word state? It's very natural that I should then turn around and say, well, what does someone mean by the word fact? Now, as it so happened, in the case of the fact, that had already been made a sort of central term of reference by Shapin in, in his book on Leviathan and the air pump, and then in, in the work he did after that. So. I was picking up something that was already there in history of science literature, but I approached it in the way that historians of ideas and historians of political thought in particular had approached questions like that, which is you start trolling through the texts, looking for people saying, I'm using this word in a new way, or looking for people saying, this word hasn't been used before, or looking, you know, and you look for commentary on the new usages of the language in order to give you a guide to what's happening. So in a sense, this is, something that happens whenever you get interdisciplinarity, people bring in ways of thinking, types of argument from the other discipline, and that changes how they set about it. And I have no hesitation in saying that my book on, on, on the invention of science is sh profoundly shaped by the fact that I was a historian of ideas and of texts before I was a historian of science. And that the strengths and its limits come from that, I think. I mean, I'd acknowledge there are certain limits that derive from that, but I think there are certain strengths that derive from that. Could I ask you what you think the limits are? Well, I think that uh, Lorraine Dayson said in a review that it was a book about w text, not about objects. And although uh, when I talk about glass thing, glass machinery, telescopes, and so on, thermometers and so on, um, I, I acknowledge the role of objects and I take objects, I think, seriously. There's no doubt it's a book about texts, um, much more than it's a book about objects. And if I hadn't come to it as a textual historian, but had come from it and as uh, somebody from uh, who worked on laboratory practice, I might have written it very differently and had thought about it a bit differently. So I, I've no doubt that creates a certain limit. Um, uh, I, you know, I hope I overcame that limit to some degree in the way I think about the what I believe is the contribution of um, vacuum pump experiments to the invention of the steam engine. That's about objects rather than about language. But you know, that's one chapter in the book. The bulk of the pressure of the book is about language rather than about objects. And, and one could say that that's, uh, that's a bias in the book that another, somebody else would not have had. And I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have, wouldn't say that was an unfair criticism. I think that'd be a fair criticism. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, now that you're talking about objects, one thing that I was particularly, something that sort of took my, my imagination was the story of Galileo taking a telescope, which would have been maybe times four magnification that would have been used by ships and deciding to make it much more powerful, obviously with the intention of observing the night sky. And I don't know if you have an answer for this, or maybe you, you, you talk about this in your biography on Galileo, but I, it left me wondering, what was that step 
that occurred in his mind to go from being happy with observing, you know, a kilometer away and thinking that, okay, this can take us to the next level. Right. Yeah. Uh, look, Harriet does it with the same ahead of Galileo. Harriet observes the moon through a telescope, draws a diagram which shows what he's seen very clearly and doesn't see what Galileo sees. Uh, there's a chap in Germany who, who looks at the moon through a telescope. There are, are other people pointing their telescopes at the sky. Um, although Galileo is probably the first and the fastest to get to sort of times 30 magnification, there are people not far behind him. So in a sense, I think the crucial thing about Galileo isn't that he points his telescope at the heavens, or even that he develops a reasonably powerful telescope. The crucial thing in Galileo's case is that he knows what he's looking for, and he knows yeah. how to interpret what he sees. Now, how does he know this? I, I think it's clear. Uh, there's a piece by Plutarch on mountains in the moon. He's looking at the moon in order to disprove the Aristotelian claim that the moon, moon is a perfect sphere. And the fact that it doesn't look like a perfect sphere means simply there's some color shift in it, not that there's a, what you might call a texture shift in it, that it's got a surface which is irregular. And Galileo can see very clearly that it's a surface that it's irregular because he himself has studied and has probably taught perspective drawing. So he knows how shadows work to show protuberances on a surface. So because he's got the whole of Renaissance art of perspective drawing behind him, being an Italian and being a mathematician and the mathematicians dealing with that, and because he's read Plutarch and thought, he's already an early premature Copernican, and he's looking for errors in the existing system of astronomy, he turns to the moon, I think, because he wants to find there something that indeed he may already think he can see with his naked eye, which is mountains. And once he's found them, he's made a big step towards disproving uh, the Aristotelian account of heavenly bodies. So I think the answer with Harriet, you know, Harriet looks at the moon and what he fundamentally seems to see is a sort of badly baked pie. You can see it's not quite, not quite spherical, but he doesn't see mountains. He doesn't see mountains because he doesn't see shadows and he doesn't see shadows because he's not looking right. And that's because English artists and English mathematicians don't teach perspective. Um, I think um, people, uh, they, they certainly know about it, but it's not ingrained in them in the same way, I think. So I think it really matters that Galileo is an Italian in this context, and it matters that he's read Plutarch, and it matters that he's already broken out of orthodox astronomical thinking. And all of those prepare him to see through his telescope something that, you know, a really brilliantly intelligent observer like Harriet can't see. He doesn't know what he's seeing. He can't make sense of what he's seeing. Well, Canada has no trouble making sense of it. He understands at once what he's seeing. Taking a step back from Galileo and going back to Columbus and discovery and the discovery of discovery, the, the sort of the conceptual opening of this new possible world that uh, Columbus's discovery seems to inaugurate. You know, now you mentioned your book as well, but you know we know now that the Vikings were possibly the first Europeans to reach America, uh, North America, you know, around uh, where sort of mm -hmm. Canada is now, and that didn't seem to matter at all to anyone. Uh, no one batted an eyelid that they had reached this place. In fact, they had thought that they had reached Asia, uh, much like Columbus. Is the, the would you say that the reasons for why the Viking discovery of America didn't have this sort of conceptual significance that Columbus's discovery of America had lie with the whole host of other reasons that you give for what follows after Columbus. That there was the printing press, there was um, perspective painting, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, in, in, in one sense, I mean, in a simple terms, I don't think any university professor knows that the Vikings have discovered America. And if he does know, he doesn't know where America is supposed to be. Um, because the Vikings aren't using sophisticated uh, 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 ways of trying to locate themselves on the surface of, of the globe. They don't probably, who knows if they're thinking in terms of a globe at all. Uh, what Columbus is doing is announcing a discovery, announcing that this discovery is what he thinks is part of Asia. That doesn't matter. It, it, it is not nearly as far away as Asia is supposed to be. Mm. And the problem ha is that the Aristotelian notion of the construction of the 
of the world, as we have a vocabulary problem here, but uh, the, of the earth, as opposed to the earth, meaning uh, the element of earth. The Aristotelian notion is that there is an element of earth, which is a sphere, and there is an element of water, which is a sphere. And these two are slightly decentered on each other so that the earth sticks up out of the water. Now, if you work with two decentered spheres like that, you can have half of a sphere sticking out of the water, but you can't have a whole sphere sticking out of the water. So you cannot have antipodes. There cannot be land at the opposite side of the globe from us. They can travel a long way in each direction, and we are on a globe. We're on a set of spherical pair of interconnected spherical surfaces, but you cannot find land at the opposite side of the globe. Because however you drew a map after you'd done uh, Columbus's discoveries, you ended up with antipodes. You ended up with land that's opposite to Italy and the bits of Europe you're worried about. And the result is, you know at once that the whole Aristotelian sphere theory of how the Earth is constructed is wrong. And you have to have a theory where the relationship between Earth and water is no longer that based upon elements that are spherical. Uh, and you have to come up with what we now call the terraqueous globe and what they start calling by the 17th century the terraqueous globe. And as soon as you've done that, you've disproved what was a fundamental knowledge system. And that's the first great knowledge. It's not, it's A is the discovery of America, which nobody in ancient Rome or ancient Greece had known about. Well, that's shocking. But B, the discovery that people like Aristotle don't know how the world is put together. And once you've got that, you've really shaken the pillar on which knowledge is based, which is that Aristotle does know how the world is put together. And Aristotelian philosophers, ever since Aristotle, have known how the world is put together. And, and that's the, the, the moment when the door opens, as it were. And it becomes possible to say, well, how many other things are we wrong about? Um, and in what ways are we wrong about them? And, and, and one of the things that radically happens then, of course, is, you know, Columbus is a sailor. This new knowledge is coming from uh, what you might call artisans. It's being disseminated by printing presses. It brings into the world of knowledge people who aren't university teachers, who aren't philosophers, who aren't hidden away in universities. Um, and <sighs> One of the features of the book is that it carries on what used to be a very powerful tradition has been much weakened in these years of saying the scientific revolution is an attack on universities and not something that happens in alliance with universities. It changes the participants in knowledge and the mathematicians are the only people who are already linked to that external world of uh, navigation and engineering and, um, and measurement. Uh, and as a result, are able to take up this new knowledge and work with it in a quite different sort of way. So the scientific revolution becomes a revolution carried out by mathematicians against philosophers. And the, there are no, nobody, I mean, a simple example of this is no university employed philosopher approves of Galileo during his lifetime, full stop. It's astonishing. Some mathematicians do, but no university employed in philosophy does. Um, and in that sense, the new science depends upon the destruction of the claims of philosophy. And the philosophers understand that, and that's why they're bitterly opposed to it. Um, and where the new philosophy, the new science is allowed into, Oxford, for example, establishes a chair in the new natural philosophy in about 1660, I think it is. But what they teach in there is anatomy. Uh, anatomy is okay. This is an area of new knowledge, which isn't particular because Aristotle never wrote about anatomy, for one thing. What they don't teach in there is the new astronomy. Um, and, and in that sense, uh, right through into the late 17th century, uh, right through until the triumph of Newton, the philosophy faculties are trying to keep the new science out. Uh, and it's only with the triumph of Newton that the philosophy faculties are reduced to accepting. And I mean, philosophers in Catholic, the Catholic Church are strikingly moving about the same pace on this, I think, reduced to accepting that, that Copernicanism is right and um, traditional astronomy is, is, is completely mistaken. Yeah, uh, so you, you raised two points that I, I want to ask about. Uh, I'll just start with the first one, and that is uh, you the examples you give of what Kuhn would call paradigm changes that have almost uh, no visible or observable, that, that, that don't generate observable disagreements between people. And this is, you know, this is a pretty important aspect of Kuhn's thesis. You know, it's called the, people call it the incommensurability thesis, right? And I, it seems it's very important to me because it's what lets 
relativism or at the very least non-scientific reasoning in through the back door in uh, in Kuhn's understanding of how science works. We mentioned the demise of the two spheres theory. There's also the discovery of the phases of Venus by Galileo, which seems to go seems to be accepted without any opposition. What I want to ask about this is what you think the examples you've given of an absence of incommensurability means for Kuhn. Do you think it's so I guess you don't think it's a necessary feature anymore of science, but do you think it's a feature that can exist? And do you think that then there are different kinds of revolutions according to how much disagreement is generated or? Yes, I think that's the way I go. Um, I, I started off as a sort of, I, I mean, I started off, you go back round about, uh, this book came out in what, 2015. Uh, it comes out of a course I taught in, I guess, 2004 would have been the last time I taught that course, where it was a course basically on uh, theory and the history of ideas. So we read Quentin Skinner, we read Kuhn, we read Chapin and Chapin's Leviathan and the Air Pump, we read some Foucault, um, and it was about sophisticated ways of thinking about ideas. And I remember teaching that course and, and we read Leviathan and the Air Pump, and I taught it as being right. And I had a young American student on the, in the class, and he said, but that's wrong. If it's wrong, you need to show it's wrong. How's it wrong? That to which he had no particular answer. But actually, that was the moment at which I think I began to think, well, how would you show this is wrong? So I started as a Kuhnian, and actually, crudely, I started as a, a Shapenite. Um, and working on, on Galileo, it was very clear that, and I'm working through Kuhn's first book, which is the Copernican Revolution book, it was very clear that he couldn't handle scientific revolutions in which the issue of incommensurability, which you've raised, didn't provoke a sustained argument between people who couldn't understand each other. And what's ab and so he had to say about the Copernican Revolution was that the Copernican Revolution was an irresolvable conflict between Ptolemaic astronomy and the new astronomy, and there were no decisive observations that determined the outcome of that. And that's one reason why it took so so long. And, and there's a sense in which that's true when it comes to the, the argument between the different competing world systems. But it's not true about Ptolemaic astronomy, which died overnight when Galileo saw the faces of Venus and persuaded the Jesuit astronomers in Rome that they could see the faces of Venus. And it died overnight because there was an agreement about how you in up interpreted observations through originally naked eye observations, but then observations through telescopes as being observations of objects that were moving on paths, we'd now call them orbits, although they don't, through the heavens, and which were illuminating us by light going in a direct line. And, and as long as you assume there's a straightforward geometry involved, what you and that one object can get in the place of another and obstruct the vision of that object, you can't disagree about the fact that Venus either, if it's lighted with its own light and is going around the Earth, ought to be visible all the time and ought to be uh, never less than a half sphere, or if it's our, if it's um, if it's on the other side of the, I'm doing this wrong now, but anyway, you, the, the, what, what, Gal, what Galileo shows is that Venus moves between being a crescent and being a full in a way that's simply incompatible with any geometry which is Earth-centered for the movement of Ge Venus. It's only compatible with a geometry uh, which is Sun-centered for the movement of Venus. Now, there, there were at the time two competing geometries which were sun-centered for the movement of Venus. One's the Copernican one, which says the Earth and Venus are both going around the sun. And the other's the Tychonic one, which says Venus is going around the sun, but the sun is going around the Earth. Observing the, the phases of Venus does not alter, does not enable you to choose between those two, but it does enable you to say that you've got an observation which is utterly incompatible with the Ptolemaic system. And everyone knows that overnight. I mean, nobody, Nobody really seriously defends Ptolemy after that. I, someone, I, someone said to me recently that there was an astronomer in France who tried to claim that Venus might be on the epicycle of the sun or something. But I mean, 
you'd have to search and search and search to find anyone who didn't accept overnight that Ptolemy was dead. And, and Kuhn, if you read Kuhn, just tries to skate right past that. Um, and there is a long income debate and one which is based upon a real disagreement about what the evidence ought to look like, because it's about partly how you handle the physical issue of what would happen if you dropped objects off tall towers and fired cannonballs to east and west. And so on. not about astronomy at all. That long debate between, which is about whether you can, whether we ought to have evidence that the earth is moving if in fact it's going around the sun. In fact, you know, Foucault's pendulum is evidence that the earth is moving. Galileo's disciple uh, sees what we now call Foucault's pendulum movements, but doesn't realize what they are. The evidence is actually already there in the 17th century, in the early 17th century. They just don't know how to, don't grasp the, how they might interpret it. That's a Kuhnian debate. It's in, it involves incommensurable disagreement about what, what sort of evidence to consider and how to interpret it, what the crucial arguments are. And that runs f f for a century. But the initial impact of saying the phases of Venus are incompatible with Ptolemy lasts 24 hours. Kuhn doesn't acknowledge that there might be these two radically different sorts of revolutions, one in which people can agree on what constitutes reliable evidence and how you would uh, weigh it up, and the other in which they can't. And both types of revolution happen in science. The discovery of America it takes about a decade for people to grasp that the discovery of America destroys the existing theory about the structure of, of the of, of the world um, and, re and requires its replacement. Um, at the end of that decade, everyone's agreed. So in that sense, Kuhn, Kuhn has a theory, which is, I think, a good theory for some scientific revolutions but he's unwilling to accept that there are others which are much more sort of Papirian ones where you simply disprove a theory by saying, we wouldn't observe this if that theory was true. And, and bang, it, there really can be some observations that are so important that there's really no way of getting around them. There's an argument out of Quine and people, there's always a way of getting around them, but in practice there isn't. And in practice, people are prepared to acknowledge there's no way of getting around them. So in other words, I think I'm a, I, I'm, I'm a sort of very, loose Kuhnian, if you think, I think that broadly speaking, we are talking about scientific revolutions involving paradigm shifts. Absolutely. We are talking about paradigms as being things that are instilled in people through training. We are talking about paradigms as create constraints on what people are prepared to believe. All of that's true. What's not true is that incommensurability always works in the way that Kuhn thinks it works. And in, and in cases where you you would say that there is incommensurability. Would you want to say that the reasons for its resolution can be found in what both sides can accept to be scientific evidence? Or would you would you agree with Kuhn that the reasons for why it eventually gets accepted remains kind of vague? There might be, he, he says that there might be aesthetic reasons why someone accepts a theory, or there might be Oh, I think, I mean, I think with the, with the phases of Venus and so on, it's because they've got a shared system of plotting the possible positions of objects in the heavens with geometrical methods. And once they've got that shared system, they, the, the, what you can do to make sense of the phases of Venus is, is constrained. It's con constrained about their under, previous un understanding of how you might plot the positions of objects in the heavens. So in that sense, I think, they, it's a, it's because they have this previous understanding of, of what they're doing that's important. Similarly, with the with, with the discovery of America, it's because they've got a previous understanding of that the Earth is a, a sphere, and that you can measure how far you've gone around the sphere and try and locate yourself on the sphere. That they come up with this puzzle that they can all recognize, which is that America is in the wrong place on the sphere for their theory. So so in order to get agreement, you need to have an, an overarching system on which they're previously agreed, which enables them to say, but look, this is decisive evidence. And between the Tychonic theory and the Copernican theory, there isn't that overarching system which enables you to get agreement until Newton comes along and says the same laws of physics apply on hypernon and on Earth. And if you accept that, you've now got a new overarching system which solves, solves all that sort of range of issues. Galileo works very hard on establishing a new physics which will deal with it, but, but it doesn't deal with it to everyone's satisfaction. And he 
he bizarrely and crazily thinks that the tides prove that the earth is moving, which nobody sensible ever. This is it's really striking that Galileo devotes whatever it is, two decades to producing what he thinks is his magnum opus. The, and the key to that is an argument which is doesn't persuade anybody ever. You know, Galileo is a great man. I admire him immensely, but you have to also see that he's capable of making the most terrible large scale errors. It's not a small error. He really believe he really bets everything on his tidal argument being that there would be no tides if the earth wasn't moving. He really bets everything on that being convincing and nobody is convinced by it. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bust. Title to say, not buying your theory, Galileo, if that's what it's based on. Um, you know, there's a, the, he doesn't he doesn't fail for no reason. He fails for a very long time for some rather good reasons. Um, I see. Uh, do you think that's Galileo being his least scientific? That theory with respect to the tidal waves and the movement of the Earth. Well, uh, yeah, yes, I do. In the sense that Galileo's theory really requires you to have one tide a day. He's living in Italy. He comes from, he's been in Venice. He's not on the coast when he's in Florence. The tides in Venice are very small, six or eight inches. They're not like they are down the road from me here where they're 10 feet all the time. But he gets people, writes to people, asks about tides. He knows perfectly well there are places where the tides are twice a day. And he tries to produce explanations which treat this as anomalous rather than realizing that this is normal. Uh, and in that sense, he simply, it, fails to collect and respect the evidence. So yes, it's his being his least scientific. And it's part of a general issue with Galileo, which is that he really does at some deep level believe that science ought to be continuing to be deductive. And when he works on theories of moving bodies, he, he wants to work deductively with his theories of moving bodies. He's, he's a reluctant experimenter. And, and consequently, he fails to develop the experimental method as depending upon providing clear accounts of how you've carried out the experiment, what the results were, and so on. He doesn't do any of that because he, he, he always thinks experiments are sort of illustrations of what is fundamentally uh, a mathematical argument. And mathematical arguments are, are geometrical and deductive. So in that sense, Galileo is, although Galileo in, brings on an experimental revolution and people go off and start testing his claims by dropping things from high buildings and seeing how fast they fall and so on, they find his account of his experience very unhelpful because he's, yeah. he's not seen uh, what the experimental method requires. And so the experimental method only becomes powerful with the Royal Society and with a bit earlier with Gilbert and magnetism, for example, what Galileo knows and reads, but isn't terribly impressed by it because it's full of lots of experiments and very little theory, which he doesn't think is very impressive. So um, Galileo on his own isn't the scientific revolution. He's, yeah. he's part of the scientific revolution. He clears the ground of Aristotelianism much more than he establishes the way in which the new science is going to work. Yep, you've already yeah, you've already uh, talked about how it's a revolt by the mathematicians against the philosophers. But despite what you've just said about Galileo, mathematics is not just this uh, pure math. It's very much applied mathematics. It's perspective painting, ballistics, cartography. And it's clear that it's also a revolt of the practical sphere of life against just the purely theoretical sphere of life. Could you say a bit about the kinds of changes in society that had to come about that made such practical inquiries into the world intellectually respectable? That's a good question too. You're a, a, a series of <laughs> interesting and good questions. Uh, I think that's a, also a question that uh, we were talking about limitations of the book. Perhaps it's a question that I hadn't didn't think about hard enough in the book. And it's a question that sort of puzzles me because there are certain respects in which the new technologies, you know, Bacon famously says, the printing press, the compass, the nautical compass, or what are the stirrup, I can't remember what his other examples are, transform the world and bring about the possibility of a new science. And we must use these as models for what science might be capable of achieving. And, and yes, there is a world in which particularly the printing press uh, and perspective painting uh, and things like the telescope are creating new technologies that are obviously applied and powerful and above all, and this is bacon, I'm suppressing it because of course it's gunpowder. Now, the interesting thing about gunpowder is how effective is it? Japanese 
adopt it and then give it up. Uh, I've seen it argued that Napoleon's cannon at the end of the 18th century are no more effective than the Roman ballista in terms of what they can throw how far. Still, I think it's simply the case, despite that hesitation on my part, gunpowder technology, trans it, people go on trying to fight battles using Roman textbooks on how to fight Machiavelli. You see Machiavelli doing this, using Roman textbooks on how to fight warfare, while well, constantly saying sort of in brackets, but of course it's slightly different because of guns. It's radically different because of guns. And, in, and, every, and warfare is the activity of governments and states and aristocrats. And so governments and states and aristocrats all have to take an interest in the new technology of warfare. And all of them understand that this involves new questions about geometry. It involves, and mathematical questions, how much shot should you put in with cannon weights and measures, as it were. But also you have to design fortifications so that cannonballs will bounce off them and not penetrate them. And you do this by drawing out star shapes on our paper to say we need forts that are built like this. And, and, and so geometricians become the designers of fortifications for the first time. Med medieval castles aren't designed by qualified mathematicians, Renaissance castles are. And, and in that sense, the bastion becomes the basis of technology that's spread across the world very quickly because it survives gun, gunfire. So in that sense, uh, I think gunpowder technology transforms the relationship between mathematics and power and, and along with that, but perhaps less important, intercontinental sailing transforms the relationship between mathematics and power. Uh, and so the new science comes on top of gunpowder technology and on top of intercontinental sailing and says, we as mathematicians know how to handle these questions. And these questions are not just airy fairy questions, they're questions of power. And consequently, states have to be concerned about them. And states are. Um, and in that sense, I think, arguably, you know, gunpowder, which doesn't feature very much in my book, perhaps ought to feature much more centrally as something that opens up a space for mathematicians to socially engage with the holders of power and changes the way in which states relate to academic knowledge. Um, and so, you know, Machiavelli, um, Machiavelli, Machiavelli, uh, Galileo teaches aristocrats how to use a some, something called a proportionate compass, which you use for calculating weights and measures, basically, and exchange rates in money and stuff like that. And he teaches them uh, ballistics. And in that sense, he is training people in the, in the new arts of mili military warfare. And that's where he gets his extra side income from, not from astronomy. Astronomy never earns him a penny, except insofar as he gets a better professorship in, in Tuscany. But the new warfare earns him a good side income, providing private in instruction for aristocrats. And, and, and that's, that's something true of all these mathematicians, that they become uh, linked directly to centers of power and centers of, of, of military and naval activity. Uh, you know, the exception, I suppose, would be Newton, whose link is through um, money and, 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 uh, and, and coining and handling that side of things, which is also a mathem set of mathematical and scientific interests. Uh, but he doesn't ever deal with directly with naval or military issues, but almost all the others deal pretty directly with naval and military issues and, and, and uh, trading on that, if I may put it like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. So I want to just bring in another concept that you use in your book, and that's uh, path dependency, uh, which I think it's a really cool concept. It sort of injects a bit of necessity into history where people might just think there are just contingent events bouncing around. You give uh, one example of path dependency. You write, once Copernicus had suggested that the Earth was not the center of the universe, but a planet orbiting the sun, people were bound to puzzle over what sort of planet it could be. And as I was reading your book, I couldn't help but think that the whole scientific enterprise might be an example of path dependency. I mean, you say, you say the contrary to this at the very beginning of our conversation, but it strikes me that, you know, once, couldn't we say that once we start observing the natural world and once we start making claims about it, that it would inevitably appear to be false and that people would be forced to inquire more accurate ways to make claims about it. And we'd get something like science, something that 
measures and makes accurate predictions and so on and so forth. Yeah, yes. I hesitated, I think, about how strong a claim I wanted to make on, in that direction. And, and I think the book sort of raises a question about how strong a claim one ought to make on that direction without answering it. And, and partly because I wanted to avoid a sort of old fashioned progressivist notion, which would be that, you know, discoveries roll one after the other in a sort of predictable yeah. fashion. But I think you make an important contingency is something they understood in the 17th century. Pierre Bale, in his wonderful book, The Thoughts on the Comet, talks about how the outcome of a battle may be determined by a horse losing a shoe, which may cause the king to fall off his horse, which may cause contin entirely contingent random event changes the course of history. But it, that's within a system where other contingent random events can change it equally in other directions. Past dependency seems to me a quite different sort of way of thinking because it's saying a relatively apparently random thing the invention of the printing press may set up a process which then becomes irreversible. The emergence of a community of scholars spread across continents and time, which prevents something like Copernicus's theory, which if it had lived in a manuscript culture, which I think have simply disappeared, actually means Copernicus's theory is sitting there in libraries and accessible and people like Galileo can lay their hands on it and refer directly to it because it's printed. And if it hadn't been printed, it wouldn't have been disseminated and it wouldn't have been a reference point in the way that it was. So in that sort of way, uh, the printing press prevents people from forgetting things. It prevents people from forgetting new theories that haven't yet succeeded. And it means that there's an enormous bank available of potential arguments that you can turn back to and say, well, perhaps we can recuperate this one because it didn't work then but maybe it will work now in that sort of way the printing press creates an incredible set of new resources even without changing anything i mean copernicus would always would always have been there but what it does is it's like you know computers it gives you access to things that you wouldn't otherwise have access to it's it's, it's sort of equivalent of google and it means that you can find things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to find and so in that sort of way i think uh there are th there are lines of argument that and there are technical developments and there are cultural developments that create uh, are like ratchets. They drive you forward in one direction and you can't come back once you've gone forward in that direction. Um, and, and you know, when, this is why when I think it's so interesting that the Japanese pick up uh, gunpowder and then abandon it because you think gunpowder was a ratchet that you couldn't abandon. And one of the questions is, well, how on earth do they... I think they just think it's unmanly to fight with gunpowder. It seems to be a cultural conflict, but it shows that they think there's something more important than winning, it would seem. Or also it shows that, you know, gun, early guns are really pretty, you know, you miss a lot with an early gun. <laughs> miss much less with swords, presumably. Um, so, so you, you, you know, you need to test these claims. And, and with gunpowder, there is a great test, it seems to me, to be Japan, where, where, where it proves not to be a ratchet affair. But you, you need to test these claims and ask, how irreversible is this and what are the consequences of it being irreversible? But I think you're absolutely right that once you've carried through the revolution in astronomy, once you've got a new physics, as you do with Newton, people are bound to then say, well, can we do this elsewhere? What, what can we do in biology? What can we do in uh, geology? What can we do? And, and in that sense, you're bound to then say, how can we roll out this way of thinking and apply it in areas it's not yet been a applied in. Um, John Gray wrote a review of my book, <laughs> which John Gray is very clever. And I was furious when I read this because I realized he'd said something that I should have said in the book. He said the argument of the book is that science itself is a paradigm. And that summarizes, I think, in a sentence, the argument of the book. And that sentence isn't in my book, and I really wish it was, because the claim I'm making is that experiments, evidence, theories, these concepts, when you learn how to apply them, provide you with a way of approaching the natural world or reality, which generates new knowledge and generates uh, new theories and generates a ratchet effect where you start progressing in your understanding. And once you do that, you start rolling it out. And the paradigm of science, it has to be modified and adapted to be applied to geology or to be applied to biology. It can't just be carried straight over, but you develop the paradigm within physics and astronomy. And then you ask yourself, how can we apply it elsewhere? Um, and in, in that sense, the paradigm is set, as I argue in the book, by 
the 1720s. But of course it has to be reshaped in order to make it usable elsewhere and in order later to make it possible to do modern physics with uh, with very different tools and, and concepts. So I'm, you know, I wouldn't want to suggest at all that science now is still what science was. The crucial thing is that the, the language of hypotheses and theories and evidence and facts is absolutely still the language in which science is conducted. Um, and the notion of what as it were, the sort of the unspoken presumption about what it ought to look like remains the same, even if once you get to quantum physics, it no longer looks like that. That's why quantum physics is so bizarre and strange. But quantum physics has to be carried on against the background of people puzzling over why it doesn't look like Newtonian science looked, as it were, in some, in some crucial sense. People, we can't find a way of mentally inhabiting quantum physics at such a degree that that it ceases to seem strange, it seems to me. I, I certainly can't, but I think even even uh, physicists can't. Um, and so in that sense, the, the, the paradigm of science has remained, even though to learn modern science, you have to learn in many ways how inapplicable it really has become. It's It's not been replaced by an alternative paradigm, I think. Right, the formal structures are still the same. You still got peer-reviewed articles, you still got experiments, facts, hypotheses. Yes, and again, you see that there, there's another thing where my obsession with language, peer-reviewed articles would be a very good example of a, of a, of a sort of conceptual, of a, of a, what, would, what do we call this? It's soft technology, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Of a procedural breakthrough, which transforms how you handle publishing. Uh, and once you've got that, you change radically how, how publishing occurs. And when do you get it? It's not there in the Royal Society. They're not peer reviewing their articles early on. I think it's probably a 19th century invention. I'm not sure. Um, but certainly it's a, it creates a foundation for modern science and it has very interesting consequences in terms of creating Kuhnian pressures, you might say, because it means you can't advance on your own. You've got to be able to take your peer reviewers with you. Um, and so it means that the community has a new way of controlling how if Galileo had been peer reviewed, he'd never have published at all. Um, and in that sense, I think it creates a rather strong conservative pressure. Yeah. Wow. That's a very good point. Yeah. I think many people have that feeling about peer review process. Well, I think, uh, my, you know, my book did not come out from university press. If it had gone through a university press's peer reviewing, it would have been subject to very radically different pressures from the ones that I subjected to. Uh, it did go to some, uh, good historians of science who who read it um and in particular yeah. michael hunter read it for the press and was very sympathetic and helpful but but i think a, a university press peer review process would have put a rad, put pressures on the book uh, and i say this having gone through more recently with power pressure power pleasure and profit where a university press peer reviewing process has put all sorts of pressures on that book which which altered character of the book, the tone, not the central arguments, but the character and tone and length of the book considerably. Just on this topic, can I ask, it's been about six years since your book has come out. What do you think the impact of the book has been in uh, academic history of science? Ah, oh, I think that's a very, that's a good question too. Um, I don't think it's had a very big impact in academic history of science because academic history of science, I think, is stuck with a set of Kuhnian paradigms that are hostile to the argument of the book. The book has had, and I'm very pleased with the impact the book has had in the sense that it's had a very wide readership and it's getting lots of citations, but the citations mainly are not from historians of science. Um, they're from scientists. I mean, it's similar to the book I did on history of medicine gets cited by doctors rather than historians of medicine. So that in, the, in that sense, um, I think uh, it's you know, the, the, the stranglehold, if I may put it like that, of cultural Construct, social constructivism and cultural relativism in history of science is, is perhaps greater than I had imagined possible and, and is being shaken much more slowly than I had imagined possible. I do believe that in the end it will have to give way. Uh, and I do believe that my book, you know, in the long run will look like an, uh, an event in that process, but it's certainly not a tr uh, on its own a transformative event in that process. So, I, I wouldn't claim to have transformed history of science. Historians of science are carrying on uh, to a large degree as if the book wasn't there. Um, I think that's their mistake, but that's, you know, their, <laughs> also their prerogative. Uh, but yeah, yeah as that. you say, it's very difficult uh, to know how long you should wait before you dismiss something's effects yes. in the future. I, 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 in, indeed. And it's also, uh, I mean, I would say about the book, 
I haven't, I've seen interesting critiques of Michael Hunter wrote a critique of the chapter on uh, decline of belief in witchcraft, which is a serious critique. I've seen, I've not seen an attempt to take apart the central argument in a way that I would find cause me to step back and think. I've seen people say interesting things about limits of the book, which I've tried to reflect in our discussion, but I've not seen anyone say, no, this is wrong because he's fundamentally failed to see this or that. Or, uh, yeah. So I think, you know, if I was re re reprinting the book or rewriting the book, it would look much the same as it does now, because I think it's broadly right. But, but you know, that's because I do think that I, it's pointless trying to write history of science without developing some way of handling progress, because progress is what makes science different from other things. If you can't acknowledge that, you can't begin to think about what science is. Unlike religion, where it's pointless trying to write religion as a history of progress, and people who have written about the history of theology as a history of progress and making some sort of category error. Science, I think, is, is fundamentally different from religion or perhaps philosophy in that it makes progress. And the test of the progress it makes is in how it enables us to get control of the world. Um, and there are very clear tests of the fact that it, 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 it pays off. And in that sense, I think to write about the history of science without acknowledging that or trying to see that that's at the heart of what the subject is, is to miss the whole enterprise. Um, and of course you can do it. You can write about, you know, you can, just as you could write a history of theology as, as if theology makes progress, you can write a history of science as if science doesn't make progress, but it's but both of them, it seems to me, are fundamentally misconceived enterprises. Um, and I think anybody who respects what science is needs to, ought to acknowledge that. But this is part of a whole wider set of issues about what's socially constructed and what isn't and what the limits of social construction are. Right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so one final question. Right. <laughs> I just like to ask you about your future projects. What are you working on now? Ah, oh, um, what I'm working. Uh, I've been struggling now for. I'm in my third year of trying to write a book on Voltaire, um, which, okay. which was a project that was sort of wasn't my. I have, I have various projects that I've always wanted to work on. I wanted to write a book on Shakespeare. I have wanted to write a book on Machiavelli. One reason why Machiavelli keeps slipping into my. Um, I had worked in the past on Voltaire, um, but I hadn't really thought about doing a book on Voltaire. And, uh, it was suggested to me, and I have been trying very hard to work out, you can see on the shelves behind me, um, collections of 18th century books, because I'm trying to take objects more seriously. And these are books that are objects that one needs to think about as right. processes in which they're produced and the co how much they cost and who, who had access to them and things like that. Um, and Voltaire is very difficult to write about because he's very slippery and he is very much aware of the pressure of censorship and he has to avoid saying certain things explicitly and so he says them indirectly and and he's also very difficult to write about because he's psychologically peculiar and he's psychologically peculiar because he's the victim of sexual abuse and so there's a set of difficulties about writing him writing about him which i think i'm slowly overcoming but it's been a really long slow process and the book is i think taking shape at last and you know there's i mean with the history of science book when I had the concept of discovery, I thought, now I can write the book. Now I understand how I can structure it. I got my first chapter, as it were, of become, ended up being sort of, but I've got nowhere I begin and I know where I'm heading to. Voltaire has been much harder because there's, there's been a series of sort of like sort of guerrilla war. You can't, you don't just win one battle and think, now I've got control of it. You, it's a series of little local conflicts and slowly I'm, principle isn't it you ne can never win a guerrilla war so it's a bad metaphor oh yeah <laughs> slowly i think i'm getting a good on it um is it uh is it going to be a biography like your galileo book or no, is it uh, no i don't like i mean galileo galileo's there are 20 volumes of the complete books of galileo half 10 volumes of which are his letters there are 200 volumes of the complete works of voltaire <laughs> of which are his letters. So the question of what, on what scale would a biography of Walter make sense is problematic. But the other problem is that because he so often doesn't say what he thinks, so often lies about what he thinks, if you just try and work along by saying, well, and then Voltaire said or did this, you're missing what he's really thinking or doing. And so, no, I think it's going to be a sort of series of essays about different aspects of his life. And one of the problems I've had is not having a model for how to write a book like that. Uh, Sylvana Thomas book on Wollstonecraft is something like a model. 
and I recently come across that and that's helpful because it sort of shows that you can you can do a book that people who read think they've read a biography interesting the reviewers say oh this is a biography which isn't actually a biography at all if you look at this structure it's not a biography it's a series of essays about what mattered to Wollstonecraft and how she thought um, and that's what I'm trying to do but if I pull it off it won't look like other than her book it won't look like any other book that I've read um, and, and that makes it much harder I've always found when writing a book until you've got a sort of model in mind it's very very hard and, and if you're doing interesting work the whole problem is that you're not repeating someone else's model you know this is Kuhn's theory of paradigms if you're repeating an existing paradigm life is easy as soon as you say you're not going to repeat the existing paradigm life becomes extremely difficult you're in crisis yeah 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 so I've been in crisis for a couple of years <laughs> <laughs> to come out of it. I think I'm coming out of it. Great. Well, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm sure it's going to be great. Thank you very much. A pleasure talking to you. Yeah, to you too, David. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye. Hi, and welcome back. That was David Wooten and the Invention of Science. I thought I'd do something a little different in this post-interview reflection. Instead of building on something that was said in the interview, I thought I'd explain something that was said in the interview in a little more detail. I'm doing this because I realized that it was a pretty technical discussion we had and that some of the finer points might have been missed by listeners that aren't familiar with the jargon. I think that there are some genuinely fascinating points and I wouldn't want you to go away from this episode without having got a good grasp of what they mean. I'll just focus on two points. The first is Thomas Kuhn's notion of incommensurability and how what David has to say in his book impacts on that notion. And the second is David's notion of path dependency in science and how that goes against some dominant ideas in contemporary history of science. Okay, so let's start with Thomas Kuhn then. Uh, so Kuhn was a historian of science and is most famous for his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, published in 1962. I've already mentioned this book a lot. I'm sure I won't stop mentioning it. It's really just one of those books. Highly recommend it. Now, I'll try to give a very simple idea of what Kuhn argues so as to give a bit of context uh, for David's thesis. So, in science, according to Kuhn, there are paradigms. And a paradigm is a way of thinking about the world. So, for example, Aristotle's paradigm required him to think that the Earth was at the center of the universe because he thought that the Earth, the planet Earth, was primarily made out of the element Earth, and that since the element Earth is the heaviest element in existence, it logically followed for Aristotle that our planet was at the center of the universe, as if it was sort of like falling into the middle. This is a paradigm. If I'm an Aristotelian, then I am within this paradigm, and if I wanted to argue, for example, that the Earth is not at the center of the universe, then I have to give an explanation for how this can be the case whilst thinking that Earth, the element, is also the heaviest element in existence, right? Or I just stop being an Aristotelian. Now, being within a paradigm and following a paradigm is what Kuhn calls normal science. Normal science is simply the day-to-day -day activity of practitioners within a paradigm who try to solve the problems within their paradigm by using the intellectual resources of their paradigm. But sometimes, problems cannot be solved within a paradigm. And when this happens, there is a crisis. And essentially, a crisis continues within a paradigm until someone manages to solve the problem from within the paradigm, or until some, someone proposes a new paradigm that manages to solve the problem. If this new paradigm is accepted by the scientific community, then we have what Kuhn called a revolution. A revolution describes a move from one paradigm to another. Okay, so that's the basic outline of Kuhn's thesis. Very broad strokes. I want to focus on what occurs in a moment of crisis right before a revolution. So let's go back to my example about Aristotle. Let's say that I disagree with Aristotelianism. I don't think that the Earth is at the center of the universe because I do not think that Earth is the heaviest element in the universe. And let's say that I think this because I have looked through a microscope and I can see that Earth 
and water, the elements, are made up of the same stuff, and that, as a result, Earth is not actually heavier than water. So I go and argue with an Aristotelian about this problem in an effort to convince them of my paradigm. They will in turn try to convince me of the advantages of their paradigm. Now, this is where the issue of incommensurability comes in for Kuhn. Since we are both wedded to our respective paradigms, there will be a long, drawn-out process of disagreement over which paradigm is best suited to explain the crisis. So to give the example from my interview with David, before Copernicus, the paradigm for astronomy was the Ptolemaic system that had existed for about 1,300 years. And one of its main tenets was that the Earth was the center of the universe. Ptolemaic astronomy was largely grounded on Aristotelian philosophy as well. In 1543, Copernicus proposed that the sun was actually the center of the universe. Copernicanism, however, was not taken seriously by any university astronomer, and it did not replace Ptolemaic astronomy for a very long time, mainly because Copernicanism did not offer better predictions than the Ptolemaic system, and because it went against a central tenet of Aristotelianism, as we've already seen. So, since it didn't make better predictions, and since it went against a central tenet of Aristotelianism, it was far more economical for practitioners of Ptolemaic astronomy to just stick with it, and hope that it will eventually solve its crisis, rather than completely change their paradigm, and have to enter a completely new way of thinking about reality. Okay, so we have this issue of incommensurability. We have two competing paradigms, and neither is able to convince the other that it is the correct one. Now, what I want to focus on is the idea that this incommensurability is a long, drawn-out affair, the implications being that sometimes evidence is not obvious. And that's problematic for science, right? Because science would like to be able to say that advances in science are made because of convincing evidence that everyone can agree on. So, for Kuhn, there has to be resistance to the acceptance of a new paradigm. Paradigms cannot just be abandoned overnight. The reasons why paradigms are resistant are, generally, that it is just more economical to stick to your current paradigm, and to hope that it will eventually be able to solve the source of the crisis than to switch paradigms. And I think this is extremely intuitive for most of us, right? It's simpler to just stick to the way that we think about things, and just to try and use that to try and understand whatever we're struggling to understand, than to completely change our way of thinking about the world so as to understand a, a new problem. It's important for Kuhn that this is the case, because his whole thesis is that science is structured by paradigms that are supposed to be resistant to change, and are supposed to be intellectually valuable to their practitioners. Okay, so let's, let's return to Ptolemaic and Copernican astronomy. Ptolemaic astronomy is the paradigm for astronomy. Copernican astronomy suggests an alternative, but practitioners of Ptolemaic astronomy are unwilling to switch paradigms. Okay, and this is where my discussion with David begins. So, in 1610, Galileo observes with his telescope that Venus has phases, much like the Moon has phases. Now, for reasons that are too complicated for the segment, this discovery means that the Ptolemaic paradigm simply cannot be true anymore. But what is remarkable is that Ptolemaic astronomers recognized and accepted this almost overnight. There was no drawn out affair whereby Ptolemaic astronomers tried to defend their paradigm. It was killed off immediately by Galileo's discovery of the phases of Venus. This is why I asked David about the implications of this example for Kuhn's theory. It introduces a notion that David calls killer facts. There are some facts that just don't lead to an issue of incommensurability, but they just kill off the paradigm immediately because they are so devastatingly true. What is more, all the adherents of that paradigm understand that they are true immediately. This is hugely important because it shows us that some changes in science are obvious to everyone involved, and that there is some evidence that simply cannot be ignored by opposing practitioners. This is good news for science. Right? So since science wants to maintain that changes in what we believe are solely motivated by evidence. This is why what David writes about a lack of incommensurability is important about his project, since it tries to put objectivity and necessity 
back into the scientific enterprise. Okay, and this brings us nicely to the second point, path dependency. So the basic idea is that there are observations or theories that show reality or explain reality so clearly or so well that they necessarily have to lead to some kind of change. People cannot just ignore them. For example, Galileo's discovery of the phases of Venus led to a complete dismissal of Ptolemaic astronomy, and that was necessary. In other words, once Galileo had discovered that Venus has phases, it would have always been the case that Ptolemaic astronomy would have been abandoned because the discovery of the phase of Venus tells us something very important about reality that the Ptolemaic system cannot explain. This might seem obvious, but it is not the dominant position in academic history of science. According to David, contemporary academic history of science maintains that observations and theories can always be manipulated to suit a paradigm. This means that there is a scenario where Ptolemaic astronomers could have been legitimately skeptical or could have found a way to accommodate the discovery of the phase of Venus without abandoning their paradigm. David's point, on the contrary, is that there are some observations that simply cannot be manipulated and that these observations necessarily lead to certain consequences. To clarify the significance of path dependency, let's consider the opposite position. What does it mean for there to be no path dependency for science? Well, it means that theoretically a paradigm could always exist, because any discovery or theory that runs to the contrary of a paradigm can simply be manipulated so as to suit the paradigm or so as to not be a problem for it. What this means is that scientific theories are not as beholden to empirical observations as we might think they are. And more damningly, that science as an enterprise does not develop because of important new evidence, because there is no standard by which to decide what is important new evidence. If you think this, then science does not develop according to evidence and scientific reasoning, but according to whatever is most popular, whoever is most authoritative, and other such non-scientific criteria. The significance of David's position is, as I said in the interview, that it injects science with a bit of necessity. Instead of claiming that the discovery of the phase of Venus might not have had any effect on the Ptolemaic system, because there is no such thing as evidence that forces paradigm change, David claims that the discovery of the phase of Venus necessarily caused a paradigm change, and would have always, because it provides such damning evidence against the Ptolemaic system. Right, so I hope these two terms, incommensurability and path dependency, are clearer now. And now you can, uh, you know, you can go away and show off your knowledge to your presumably hundreds of other friends who are deep into history of science. My next interview will go live on the 24th of January 2022, so please stay tuned for that. It'll be an interview with Greg Wolf, author of The Life and Death of Ancient Cities. And this is a really curious book. Uh, Greg wants to tell the history of urbanization, so the history of building cities, beginning from the earliest cities in the Mesopotamia region, through the lens of evolution. It was the first time I had ever thought of urbanization as being explicable through the evolutionary framework, and we ended up having a great discussion. Okay, so please make sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. You can find all information on upcoming interviews and ways to get involved at my website, www.pleaseexpand.com, and follow me on Twitter, at pleaseexpand, with just one E between the words. I've also got three blog posts on my, on my website, on each of the three books that I've done so far. Have a look at them if you're interested in thinking more about these issues, and please leave a comment. I would love to know what you think, and maybe we can even start a conversation. So, all the best from me. Uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, bye-bye.